Our speaker today is Vincent Jenna. We get a lot of great speakers here, but occasionally we get one from the mainstream international speaking circuit, and Vincent Jenna is one of those speakers. He's known as a triple power psychic medium. He's been interviewed on major national and international radio and television shows, including Coast to Coast AM, Hay House Radio, CBS, NBC, ABC, Hallmark Channel, Gaia TV, Spain Radio, Canadian Radio, and others. He's trained with the world-renowned mediums such as James Van Praag and Tony Stockwell at the Arthur Findlay Psychic <coughs> Sciences College in England. Recently, he's been communicating with distressed animals. Lion Television in the UK featured Vincent's animal communication on one of their shows. <coughs> but that's the uh, public Vincent. That's the publicity packet Vincent. The real Vincent reminds me of a theory I've held for a long time. That God has a special fondness for wounded healers. They're in the perfect position to help others because they walked the path themselves and have mastered it. And Vincent Jenna is one of those people. So please welcome our friend, our brother, our teacher, Vincent Jenna. Thank you. Okay, and now I'm going to drive the cameraman crazy. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank the fellowship board and uh, Pastor Saren uh, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. And you said that today's service is going to be long. Uh, you must have attended one of my lectures. <laughs> so, warn everybody. And, um, and um, I'm going to do the best I can being an Italian and holding a mic in one hand. You possibly may only get one half of my talk, but I'll switch back and forth because I use my hands all the time. So, I was invited here to speak at the International Association of Near-Death Studies. I did not have a physical death. I had a spiritual transformative event and which basically had part of me that had gone then and a new part of me uh, took over, um, not so willingly. But um, one of the things that always fascinated me about them is why? Why do we have them? Why do we have even a spiritual transformative event? Wow. You know, it sounds so special, right? And actually it is, because not everybody experiences, and I have a theory about that, maybe that not everybody needs to experience it. Now, we're in a universe that's not random, right? We all know that. We all know that everything happens for a purpose then. So that near-death experience, or any spiritual transformative event, which we all are going to have eventually, we all must go through a spiritual transformative event of some kind. Doesn't matter how long it takes, but eventually we are going to, our, our lives here are going to wind up transforming spiritually once we start to recognize who we really are, right? So there's got to be a reason then why they are happening. And why we might need them. You know, any type of spiritual transformative event or near-death experience. We all go through a death experience. That's the interesting thing, is we all have a death experience, right? We die, and then we go over there into the new realm, feel who we really are, get all of this love, remind us of our unlimited potential and abilities, and then we come back here and we do it all over again. So. That's kind of like the same thing that a near-death person has gone through. They died, they went through an experience, and then they came back, and maybe for some, maybe for all, they wind up doing something new with that, because it's a new experience for them. A lot of times it takes a while to understand what that experience is about, and what am I supposed to do with this now, with what I came back with? Some knowledge, some understanding, right? So I tend to believe that they all happen for a reason. And in some way, when we go through those events, you know, whether you want to admit it or not, but there's a part of you that feels different than everybody else, right? There's a part of you that says, well, not everybody's experienced this. I experienced it. And 
Maybe you can even, after you get over the confusion, after you get over the shock, after you get over the wonderment of what just happened, maybe you're left with the feeling of, wow, this was special. Well, I know that happened to me. I had an extremely tormented youth. Those who were here yesterday with me have heard that. I was the one who was beat up and bullied in school almost every day, had to run home to protect myself every single day. I was shoved in lockers, head thrust in toilets, thrown in dumpsters, stripped and thrown into assemblies to be humiliated. And a home life was just as threatening for me because mom, mom had some mental pathology because she had been sexually molested by her brother and cousin until she was 13 years old. So she had borderline personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, general anxiety disorder, and took that all out on me and my brother. And then on top of that, I was sexually molested by my cousin, who used to babysit me, and also by the parish priest who was coming over to take care of mom. Right, so I went through that torment. That did not make me feel like a special being. Not at all. Oh, I had some resilience. What kept me alive is I was a performer myself. I was a singer and dancer, and for a kid, I was really good at it, you know? And I latched onto that because when I was on stage and all the applause that I wound up getting because I was so good, you know, that was my acceptance. That was my love. But that didn't last because then after I would get off the stage, if it was a school assembly and everybody was there, they would beat me up afterwards because they were jealous over what I just did. Or I got home and dad would turn around and say, no matter what part I had, well, why couldn't you be the lead? And very early on, I wanted that to be my career because at least I got something. Right? Mom used to say, nothing comes from the genus, so why do you think you're so special? And there's that word, special. When we hear it all the time through our lives, whether we've gone through tormented lives, like I did, and believe me, mine's not an exceptionally tormented life, there has been even more, the profession that I'm in as a psychic medium, a spiritual teacher, you hear even worse stories than I've been through. Right? But we always come back to that idea of not being special. We heard it all the time. You know, oh, Mom, I don't like this dinner. Can I get something else? No, you're eating what I made you. What do you think? You're special or something? Right? Hello, Johnny, can you sit down in the back and listen to what's going on? Do you think you're special or something? We get that all the time, right? We even try to feel that specialness. You know, we work hard, we're waiting for the promotion, we're waiting for that, that increase in salary and stuff. And we leave there because we don't get it and we don't feel special. So, to me, all those special events then have a purpose a major purpose. Now, in the research that I've done about NDEs and STEs and any other transformative event, they never happen to people who have had the Brady Bunch childhood. <laughs> they never happen to anyone who had the perfect parents, the perfect upbringing, they know their divinity, they know that they're unlimited in some way, they have all the confidence in the world because they've been supported 100%, all the love in the world because that was the most important thing that they received when they were growing up. None of them have ever had an NDE. And that's why I believe 
that those events are happening purposely. Yes, we'd like to think, okay, we're in a physical body, I died, the doctor brought me back. But isn't it true that we manifest everything, including the death? We do. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. What does that mean? We're energies having a physical experience. And as science teaches us, energy manipulates matter. And our bodies are made of matter. Therefore, our energy, no matter what has happened to your body, you somehow cause that. <laughs> That's a hard thing to believe, but, and that you want to believe, oh my gosh, so I'm the cause of my own cancer? I'm the cause of my heart attack? Yes, unfortunately, and fortunately, yes. Unfortunately, because you went through it. Fortunately, because if you went through it, you can also be in control of it. That you're not a victim. We are not victims here. Therefore, some way, somehow, we even set up the need for that spiritual event to happen. And why? Because our specialness has been taken away from us. Now I know you hear and you gather and we hold hands, but being the counselor and psychic medium I am, okay, there is so much about you to be doing intellectually with your left brain but not feeling it in your heart and your right brain about you. We can convince ourselves of anything. I have a workshop and a CD to it called God It's Not Working. The key to finally stop saying that. <laughs> and it's interesting because those, especially like yourselves, that are on a spiritual journey, you apply all the teachings. They're fabulous. Teachings on how to manif manifest, how to attract, all about your beliefs, your glorious, your creation from the God source. And you can use that God source. Your creator, co creator with that God source. And you know all of that, and you keep trying to apply it. And you go to classes, and you go to lectures, and you read these incredible books, but you still wind up saying, if you have not manifested the things in your life that you want, if you have not manifested an absolutely unconditional loving relationship, if you have not manifested a vocation that is rewarding and fulfilling, or perfect health, which is what we've all been promised we can do, then you are saying, God, it's not working. And the reason why you're saying that is because you don't believe you're special. You're just one in 7.2 billion people, at least just on this planet. And Lord knows how many there are on all the other universes, right? You're just one, one person. And one person who has not been nurtured and developed into believing that you're special. See, and here's the interesting thing, and this is why I know this. Because when I have clients coming to me, this is, this is a phenomenon that happens all the time. Especially now, with the new thought, new age, metaphysical movement, we have a new anomaly that's going on. All of you know this material. And it could make you feel special again. I know this. I'm walking a different talk than most other people are. I'm loving, I'm caring, I'm this and I'm that. And that's fabulous and you're doing a great job at it. But the majority of you are faking it. Because you still don't believe you're special. Because you haven't been able to manifest in your life what you want. Because there is the first set of beliefs that were created for you when you were in your youth, your child, your inner child, all the messages from the environment that you received, all those negative messages caused you to form your first set of maladaptive beliefs. I call them the I'm nots. 
I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not handsome enough, I'm not tall enough, I'm not worthy enough, I'm not deserving enough, I don't care what the I'm not is, that's the message you pulled out and interpreted from the way you were treated, from the words you heard. Children are egocentric. They blame themselves for everything that goes on in their lives because they think the world revolves around them. They don't have the capacity. You didn't have the capacity to understand. I actually had somebody sit in front of me yesterday and they do this all the time and say, oh, I remember my childhood. I never thought I was unloved. I always thought that when mom and dad were acting that way, that that was their issue. I said, really? Wow. You mean at five years old, you knew all of that? Well, let's switch places. I want a reading from you. <laughs> and why we do that, again, it's a defense. So here you start with this first set of maladaptive beliefs, the I'm nots. Well, those are painful to live with. And as soon as you're old enough and your brain starts developing and becomes strong enough, it then creates a new set of beliefs. A set of beliefs that are going to shield you and protect you from the original set of beliefs. Now here's the interesting thing about that. Our minds are almost like computer hard drives. Whatever you put in there is going to stay in. Interestingly enough, a computer hard drive you can format and remove everything from it. The human mind, you cannot format it. And you know what? Everybody's trying to do that. They're trying to format their past and wipe it clear. And you can't do that. Nor are you meant to do that. Living in the here and now has nothing to do with forgetting your past. You use your past to understand the pains and the hurts you might have and the beliefs that you formed about yourself because of those pains and hurts in order to clear that away and really truly create a deeper set of authentic beliefs. But you can't create a new set of positive beliefs from the old set of maladaptive beliefs. It doesn't work. So, like in my workshop, it says you have your adult-made mind, your adult mind. I call it the adult-made mind because as an adult, you are responsible now for all the beliefs you put in there. And you can see in the world, you can see it in the world, the new beliefs. Wow, I used to think it was me and that I was stupid. It's not me, I'm not stupid, it's my boss. He's stupid. He doesn't recognize how good I am. Right? Oh, I'm not having problems with love. It's my wife. It's my husband. It's my partner. We're being tormented because we've got gays in the world. It's we're being ruined. Our economics are being ruined because of the government and the politics and the president and everything else. It's everything else except us. And that's because it hurts too much to think we're the ones who have caused our own lack. So, things happen. They don't happen to everybody, but eventually, like I said, you're going to go through something in order to wake you up. Okay, I call it, you know, there, there's religions that actually refer to um, their new awakening as a born again. I was born again, right? Um, I call it awakening. It's waking you up to already who you are, to the greatness of who you are. So if you are a person who's had a tormented life, there's a very good chance that because you don't feel special, something's going to happen to help you feel special. Now isn't it amazing, think about this for a moment, why is it that in a regular, normal span of life, we die, we go back to the other side, when we choose to come and incarnate again, we come back down on earth and we forget everything. But in a near-death experience, 
the majority of people who've been through ex the experience don't forget. Was that unintentional? Oh my gosh, they're waking him up. Oh, I didn't wipe his mind out of his memory. He's going to remember all of this. Ah, oh, man. Ah, oh, no. No, it was intentional. Because some way, somehow, your soul has got to remind you who you are. There are many people who've had those experiences, be it near death or be it spiritually transformative, and that's I'm one of them, who come back with a different ability. Or maybe they didn't come back with a different ability, maybe the ability was finally awakened, that you had a purpose. You came here to make a difference. And it's interesting because if you look at what defines a near-death experience, one of them is you start definitely on a spiritual journey, and one of the other ones is you feel the need to want to help humanity. So here, the universe that is conspiring with you, everything that goes on, including our guides, our loved ones, our angels, whatever you want to call them, our ascended masters that are coming to us when we do cross there, and we're there at any point. And by the way, you don't have to die to see them or feel them. You have to open up. But I kind of feel that maybe we're a little bit more stubborn. I felt that. What's interesting is I didn't share this yesterday, but before I went through my spiritual transformation at 28 years old, there was always an interest in me to be associated with the church in some way. And of course, in New York, all Italian boys must become altar boys at 13 years old. I think it's written in the law. <laughs> at least my mother's law, anyway. She convinced me that it was national law. So I was an altar boy, but, but I enjoyed being an altar boy because I got into discussions with priests to tell them they were teaching God and Jesus wrong. <laughs> It earned me many smacks in my head, right? But I was even drawn to it as I got older, even though I wanted to be a professional actor, I was actually drawn to almost becoming a minister. At 17 years old, I actually stayed with a friend of mine who was at a seminary and becoming a priest. And I just loved the idea of getting more involved in it, but I didn't like the religion itself and the dogmatic stuff because I had a different belief altogether. So I let go of that. I let go of needing to talk about God and Jesus and who we are here on earth. And I used to get the beatings like you cannot believe because my mother thought that I condemned the entire family to hell because of that attitude that I had. What do you think, you're special? That's what she said. What do you think, you're special? You think you can save the world? I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I still want to be an actor, but I'm talking about that I have talked with the priests. So I was drawn to it. Now here was the funny thing. I was so intent on becoming an actor, so wanting it, so needing it, so wanting that Emmy, that Tony, that Oscar to prove how great I was, oh my gosh, and to prove my specialness. Because I was that good. I even found out that Neil got an Emmy from the Ions Association. I'm so jealous! <laughs> no, not really. But here's the thing. What I am doing today is exactly what I came in to do and didn't know it. Because of the story, because of my childhood, because of the pain. Pain pushes you further away from your God source, not to it. Which is why we have to stop it. We can use it to get closer to the God source and who we are, but it's not a guarantee, and the way it's going in the world today, it certainly is not always working. 
So here I am realizing that I'm special. I am special. And so is each and every one of you. Jesus said before it was bastardized by a council, I am the way and the truth and the life. I and my Father are one. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. And the rest of the sentences were, and so are you. That's why he came down here, to remind us who we were, to make us feel special again, because nothing from the God source can be less than special. We're acting less than special because we were never taught to believe we were. You don't need an NDE. You don't need an STE. You need to choose and understand and finally wipe away that first set of beliefs of I'm not good enough. You're more than good enough. But you've got to admit that you're feeling that first. And you don't need the stories to make you special. There's only one story. You were created. That's what makes you magnificent. So I want to thank you because I feel special for being able to come and share with you. And I feel special that you can see the real you and reflect upon it even by someone else's words. So thank you for having me today. Thank you very much. And just remember how special and magnificent you are. Thank you. God bless.